Jordan Peterson and Bishop Robert Barron are two of the most prominent defenders of God and religion against modern atheists. I'm going to share two clips from their most recent discussion that do a really good job in putting the burden of proof ball in the court of atheists, particularly those who are advocating for a secular moral philosophy. The first clip sort of sets up the second one. And I'll add some thoughts in between and then finish by explaining how what they are talking about here is the best evidence for God. Let's get started. It infuriates you because it does me when the, the new atheists in a kind of cavalier manner will just, you know, toss the Bible aside, Bronze Age mythology, you know, old fashioned pre-scientific nonsense. And what dangerous magic they're dealing with there. I mean, because here's this thing that has defined Western culture and, as you say, undergirds most of our artistic expressions and tracks with our deepest psychological aspirations and needs. What, what a tragedy when the Bible is, is trashed that way, you know? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's, such a, it's, it's, it's a strange combination of utter oversimplified misinterpretation, right, yeah. to read the Bible as an, uh, what would you say, an archaic scientific theory, because it wasn't, right. partly because there weren't Everyone. scientific theories 2,000 years ago. We could start with that. But then, well, seriously, you know, and then, and then to, to, to insist upon the most simplistic yeah. possible depthless misreading of the stories, uh, but, they but then to throw the baby out of the bathwater right. on the moral side is, it's, it's surprising, you know, it's surprising. Sam Harris, for example, you know, Sam partly insists upon his scientism, let's say, because Sam, maybe somewhat uniquely among the new atheists, really did wrestle with the problem with evil. And part of the reason that he wanted to ground a morality in the objective truth was because yeah. he wanted to develop a morality that was sufficiently robust that evil could be properly categorized and then pushed back against. And I, th I think the problem with Harris's approach is the kind of objectivity that he is attempting to base science on cannot be reconciled with, an, with morality itself. He, he's got his philosophical categories mixed up badly and, and his project has to fail, which, and I, I think it has. A tree grows because of its root system, the deep foundation upon which it grows. In fact, it wouldn't grow otherwise. If you detach the visible part of the tree from its foundation, it might look good for a time, but it will surely die. This is the case for secular morality. Like a tree detached from its foundation, morality without God withers and dies. This is the very important idea that secular moralists miss. Moral law is not a subjective human innovation. It's objective, exists outside of us, and it has been observed, recognized, and received, like the law of gravity, for example. We don't create it. We've simply recognized it. The Ten Commandments were given to Moses. We were told by Christ to treat our neighbor as ourself. These precious apples grew from the tree of Judeo-Christian values planted, watered, and protected by God. When we attempt to detach this moral law from its source and claim it as our own, we immediately become our own God and make our own laws. This is precisely why secular moralism quickly devolves into relativism, or in a word, fails. When morality is detached, from the objective's source from which it came, anything goes. And this is precisely what we are seeing today. When we detach ourselves from God, the source and foundation of moral law, our own voice and desires overwhelm the voice and desires of our conscience. And this leads us to the second clip, wherein Peterson makes a phenomenal argument for God from conscience. Listen to this. Tell me what you think about this. So, you, you, you know, you talk about, you're pointing, I suppose, for young people and, and older people as well, to where they might search for the voice or the appearance of God. And you're suggesting that one of those places in what's, in what's beautiful, and that's reminiscent for me of Moses' encounter of the burning, yeah. with the burning bush, which is something that calls to him, which he goes to investigate, and that's a pathway to God. What you see with Elijah is that that pathway to God isn't so much something that beckons. In his situation, it's more something that, that imposes transcendent limits. And so Elijah is the first prophet who firmly, he, 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 he engages in combat against Baal, who's a nature god. You can think of nature, the nature god is very similar to the Gaia that the environmentalists worship. Right? It's the projection of what's of the highest value into the natural world. And so even if the environmentalists claim that they're not deistic, 
doesn't matter. They have an implicit deism that associates the highest good with the natural world. And it's a powerful argument because, and this is what Elijah contends with, because if you're in a thunderstorm or a hurricane or you experience an earthquake or a volcano or you look up at the heavenly skies, you can feel a sense of awe and you can feel that there's something beyond you that's, let's say, embedded in the mysteries of the world. And it's easy to confuse that with God. Now, what Elijah realizes, and this is his famous statement, is that he's in a cave and he experiences a number of powerful manifestations of the natural world. This is after he's defeated the prophets of Baal. And he hears this still small voice call to him within. And that's really, that's not even so much the voice that calls to adventure or beauty, which is part of that. It's, it's conscience yep. per se. And right. this is another place that people can look for God, you know, and it's, 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 it's a rough search in some ways, you know. God, at least in part, is the spirit that wakes you up in three in, at three in the morning when you violated a higher part of yourself and calls you on your misbehavior. And you might say, well, why would you associate that with a transcendent spirit and let's say with God? And part of the answer to that is try controlling it. Right. Or try convincing it that it doesn't have a point, which is what you're going to be doing desperately at three in the morning when you'd rather let yourself off the hook for your stupidity, but something within you absolutely refuses to allow you to do that, and it's something that you can't control. And so since it, it, since it calls you on your misbehavior and you can't control it, I would say that the impetus is on the atheistic types to account for its phenomenology. It's like, well, it's a spirit, it has autonomy, it seems to have a voice, it calls you out your misbehavior, so it has it a moral, you it knows you completely, even better right. than you know yourself, that's right? Exactly it, why, mm -hmm. That's why John Henry Newman took that right, as the best right. argument for exactly. God's existence. Exactly. He yeah. felt that after Hume, the more cosmological arguments were suspect. So yeah. he went in the typical modern way inside, but found that path. Because yeah. I would say it's the, it's the unconditioned good that is, is summoning you to, to goodness. Right. Bishop Barron mentions here how John Henry Newman believed this to be the strongest argument for God. And I agree. I've done a few videos on the logical arguments for God from arguments like causation, intelligent design, the teleological argument, etc. But these are blah, blah, blah compared to the interior spiritual experience. Believers who have experienced God at work in their life know that this something exists outside of ourselves. We have a healer, protector, strengthener, judge, and in this case, a caller outer within us that isn't us. Peterson's powerful description of this independent and autonomous spirit at work within us offers conscience as evidence convincingly. Even more are the benefits experienced and the type of person we become and the things that happen to us and the life that we live when we listen and act in accordance with our conscience. Secular morality ultimately fails because each individual subjectively listens to themselves rather than the universal objective voice of conscience that keeps our own thoughts, desires, and will in check and buttressed to the good and true. When it all comes down to it, an individual detached from their conscience is the same thing as a moral system detached from God. And modern atheists know that they must prove that a moral system detached from God works. And their problem is it doesn't. Bask in this, my fellow believers. <laughs>